So in this video, what we're going to be taking a look at is externalities. And really what we were taking a look at is these externalities, these are extra costs or damages. Sometimes they can be extra benefits or rewards that society receives above and beyond the individual's consumption. Right? And this turns out to be extremely problematic when we're talking about pollution, when we're talking about environmental damage, and thus this externalities will wrap nicely into our future conversation that we'll have on environmental economics. So to start off, let's go jump over and let's take a look. Uh, in specific, what we're talking about with this whole bit with externalities is we said, hey, we have a market failure whenever marginal cost does not equal marginal benefit. Right? We said, hey, that was our definition of market failure. That's what we wanted to watch out for. Anytime this was true, right? we had that. That was our market failure. Where right, the opposite case was that if marginal cost equals marginal benefit, well, then at that point there, we were allocatively efficient. Well, great, we have this definition of market failure. Here's gonna be our first kind of situation where we're gonna put it to practice. And in putting it to practice here, what we're really gonna be looking at is, well, okay, marginal cost, marginal benefit. Whose? Whose marginal cost, whose marginal benefit are we talking about? Right, and in this case here, what we really need to distinguish between is what we would call the marginal social cost versus the marginal private cost. Where in this case here, marginal private cost, okay, keep in mind, let's, let's, let's draw this. We're talking about our market. We had price, we had quantity, and we said, hey, look, here's our supply curve. And the supply curve was also our marginal cost of the firm. And then we aggregated up across all the firms and got the market marginal cost, the market supply curve, and we worked that out as such. But, okay, in that case there, that's the individual firms, all of that. So this, as we show it, this would also be, right, we could just write it as marginal cost, or we could be a little bit more specific, and we could say that this is actually our marginal private cost. The extra cost for an extra unit as incurred by the firms who are producing. Sometimes, sometimes when firms produce, when firms go through the process of creating the stuff that they produce is, okay, they have costs of production which they incur, but there's also costs of production that are not incurred by the firm. And these extra costs fall on society on whole. And these extra costs become the marginal social cost, such that, Hey, for a lot of goods, these may be one and the same, in which case we don't need to distinguish. Marginal social cost is marginal private cost. That is, all of the costs of production are borne by the firm. We are only interested whenever a firm does its production, but they have external costs which are borne by society which the firm doesn't pay for. That is the issue that arises. The distinction between the two? The distinction between marginal private and marginal social is what we would call the marginal external cost. Such that we could just say that the marginal social cost is equal to the marginal private cost plus the marginal external cost. And let's take a look at an example of this. Let's take a look at how exactly this works and be able to think through it. So let's take a look at a bit of an illustration and talk through this. So illustration, let's suppose we have a factory here. And so here's our factory. It's producing, I don't know, maybe this is a pulp mill, right? Because pulp mills, if you've ever driven by a pulp mill, they have a lovely smell that's attached to them. That's clearly sarcasm. Um, pulp mills smell terrible, right? There's a lot of noxious fumes that they release. As well, at the same time, let's suppose that this here runs along a river here. And pulp mills, they have a whole bunch, they need a ton of water in order to create pulp into paper on the right, like. And as a result, they also have a whole bunch of 
wastewater that they then discharge. Now, okay, typically speaking, right, in modern society, we have really strict rules on the discharge of effluent, on what exactly they're allowed to pollute and why, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But keep in mind, that's all fairly new, right? We didn't always have these kind of laws if we go back 100 years. So as this producer, right, so here's our firm. Here's our firm. As their quantity of pulp increases, well then, right, that's our quantity supply to pulp. So does our marginal cost, right? The extra cost to produce an extra unit. And that's due to this whole diminishing marginal product of labor, diminishing marginal product of capital. We saw this happening in our short run cost curves. We have this upward sloping marginal cost. But keep in mind what this truthfully is, this is just the cost of the firm. This is just, hey, their cost of capital, their cost of labor, their cost of raw inputs. All of these are getting more and more expensive for every extra unit consumed. Extra cost for an extra unit. Here's the problem. Here's our pulp mill. We also have our town, right, where our people live, work, go to school, play, etc. And all of these people in the town, well, they are, at least a good number of them, are workers, managers, etc. at this pulp mill. They're getting their livelihood from this pulp mill. So, yes, they want this pulp mill to stay in business because they're getting this benefit of being able to have a job, being able to have their livelihood, settle their lives in this town because this pulp mill is here. Problem with it is, though, is that, hey, as the pulp mill makes pulp, there is all of this pollution going into the air. And it's noxious fumes, it smells terrible, it has health effects, and we're finding every year more and more environmental causes of illness, um, dementia, asthma, ADHD, Many of these are being linked now to environmental factors, and environmental being really the pollution we're putting into the environment. So, okay, all of that, that's an extra cost that is being incurred, keeping in mind, hey, the more quantity of pulp they make, the more output they also have of this pollution. So, hey, more pulp, more pollution, right? You can think, hey, these are complements of production almost. Quantity supply to pulp month, up, quantity supply to pollution, up. At the same time, the more pulp they produce, the more effluent goes out into the river here. And thus, as the people get their drinking water for their houses, well, that all comes from that river and thus has to deal with all the contaminated water into it. So now the people of this town, they need to pay for a much more powerful water treatment plant in order to make sure that, hey, the water that they're getting is actually good drinkable water and can't be lit on fire or things like that, as in the case of Lake Flint, Michigan. So, okay, that's the idea as to what's happening. And what we really see in this is that given this firm's actions, given them producing pulp, yes, they have their costs of production that go up as they produce more. But what we also witness is that as this firm produces, there is also these additional costs, this cost of pollution and pollution up into the air, pollution into the water, such that the costs are borne by society, right? The firm doesn't have to pay to pollute the air. The firm doesn't have to pay to pollute the water. It's not part of their operating costs. That is, as they're going through their whole how much pulp do I produce? What is my marginal cost equals marginal revenue to figure this out? They're only worried about their marginal private costs. This extra cost, right? That there, that there is an extra cost. This here, this is an extra cost. Every unit produced is going to have an extra cost for the extra unit. So we would have our marginal external cost, right? That would be the change in external cost for a change in units produced. And so the result is all this extra cost, who pays for it? Who is ultimately end up stuck paying for it? Well, that is altogether society. 
and thus we have our marginal social cost. And now all of a sudden we're stuck paying for it. We're stuck now putting part of our taxes towards wastewater treatment. We're stuck putting part of our taxes towards health care to treat the symptoms of this pollution because we have to pay for a cost of the firm's production. And that now comes from tax revenue or from collective just costs that we have to bear. Maybe we don't pay for it. Maybe we don't have the resources to do water treatment. Maybe we don't have the resources for the extra health care. So we're just stuck incurring this cost, bearing this cost, and the fact that we have to deal with low quality water. The fact that we have to deal with the health problems that go with it. And so in this case here, what we would say is that by this firm producing pulp, they have all together we would say a negative production externality such that there is an extra cost being borne onto society which the firm does not pay for. And keeping in mind, right, our whole reason why firms exist, going right back to producer theory, these firms exist to maximize profit. That is, when they are taking a look at their costs, they want to keep their costs as low as possible. They don't want to think about these pollution costs if they don't have to. Historically, they've had the right to pollute. They've just been able to dump this in the water, dump this into the atmosphere, and not think twice about it. They've been able to use this resource of the environment as free. It has not had to enter into their, into their calculus, into their accounting of what their costs of production are. So would they willfully include this? No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't willfully include these extra costs because that would just hurt their bottom line. And thus, we'd have a market failure. Thus, we have case, we have an argument for the government to intervene. So let's take a look at how exactly we model this. Let's take a look at what exactly the impacts of this are on society. So let's go over and take a look at a market for pulp. So in our market for pulp, we would have our price, our quantity, and we would have downward sloping. I'm going to say this is my marginal benefit, but just like we did for our costs, we could do the same thing. We could say, hey, this is my marginal social benefit. And I'm going to say in this case here, this is one and the same as my marginal private benefit. That is, if this is the market for pulp, which is ultimately the market for paper, the benefit that I get from consuming the paper is one and the same as the benefit society gets. That is, I'm a part of society, so my benefit is society's benefit. It's not like by me using a piece of paper, society is like getting huge benefit because I was able to use that paper. No, 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 no. I just got benefit from being able to write notes, maybe draw pictures, something like that. And my benefit was society's benefit, one and the same. What we also have is we have our supply, so upward sloping. And this guy here, this is our supply. This is our marginal private cost, right? The supply is the private cost of the firm. The, and again, let's, it's been a while. Let's define what marginal cost is. That was the change in total cost for a change in output. How much extra cost did we receive in order to produce an extra unit? And again, this is just the firm. This is just the extra cost for an extra unit being, well, I should say, this is plural, by the firms, right? We aggregated up all of our firms horizontally to get this market supply curve. Based off of this, where did we wind up? Well, we wound up at a equilibrium quantity and a equilibrium price. So we'll call that, I'm going to go QP for Q private and P, P for price private. At this point here though, as we just went and took a look at in this previous case, we saw that, okay, firm going through their whole decision, they're going to witness market price. They're going to figure out, okay, marginal revenue, price equals marginal cost. And then boom, we're going to get our Q star from each firm and our total market quantity exchanged. But keep in mind, right, what's happened here is we have ignored all of those extra costs to society. 
We've ignored the pollution costs to the atmosphere. We've ignored the pollution costs to the runoff into the streams. If we actually think about these as a social cost, well, what we would end up having as a result of that is we would have, okay, our marginal private cost. Let's keep in mind we said marginal social cost was equal to marginal private cost plus our marginal external cost. So this was our kind of cost of labor, capital, inputs. This here, this is our extra costs. And keep in mind, these are marginal extra costs. How much extra cost I end up facing for that extra unit. How much extra labor cost I face per extra unit. Extra capital cost for an extra unit. Extra input cost for an extra unit, right? So ones that the firm explicitly sees, ones that society ends up bearing that the firm doesn't really care about. Ideally, they don't want to care about it because that's going to hurt their profitability. Okay, in that case there then, this marginal external cost, that gives us a higher cost altogether as society, such that we would have a marginal social cost line somewhere up here. Such that if we were to take a look at this, our vertical distance between our marginal social cost and our marginal private cost, keep in mind what was the difference between social cost and private cost? The external cost. So if we took this, that vertical distance, that was my marginal external cost. How much extra cost I face for an extra unit. What we witness with this then is we witness we get a different equilibrium quantity exchanged. We get instead that we should have Q, and I'm going to call that Q social, such that from a socially optimal perspective, we're saying, hey, yeah, we need paper, right? We use paper for a lot. We get benefit from paper as a society. But if the firm doesn't account for their costs of pollution, the firm is going to, by default, produce too much paper and charge too little for paper. From a social perspective, if we actually account for the damages done to society by producing paper, well, we should altogether produce less paper, produce, consume less paper, and we should at that point there pay, and I'll call this PS for P social, we should also pay a higher price per piece of paper we use. And in this way here, this would be more of a socially optimal situation, such that, hey, at Q social, what do we have? Let's, uh, let's change over to yellow to see this. Q social, let's carry that up. Well, let's use an actual line there. We carry that up and then we hit right here. And what do we have? We're hitting both the blue line, the blue line, that is our marginal social benefit. And then we're also hitting, what else are we hitting? Yellow line up, that's our red line there too. That's our marginal social cost. So that is at this quantity exchange, this Q social quantity exchange, our marginal social benefit is one and the same as the marginal social cost. Society is now in equilibrium. And thus at this point, at this point, we would be allocatively efficient. Problem. Why wouldn't this happen on its own? Well, on its own, the firm doesn't care about those pollution costs. If the firm doesn't care about those pollution costs, profit maximizing firm is going to go through marginal revenue, marginal cost, supply and demand to give us price, price is marginal revenue, go through, and we would get our private quantity there. From that private quantity that's in green, we would go up, we would get this bit right here. And we'd say, okay, yeah, there's the marginal social benefit that I receive. And that's going to be equal to the marginal private cost. But keep in mind, at this quantity, this is the benefit society receives. Carry that all the way up. That's the extra cost to society. Meaning at this privately 
the private optimal where firms would produce if just left to themselves, we are going to be producing way too much all the way up, way much extra cost to society. So not ideal. Let's work out then, right? In order to really show this, we've kind of seen, okay, hey, marginal social cost is greater than social benefit. This is bad. We're incurring more costs than benefits. Well, let's work through this as kind of a surplus analysis. So let's go through and let's kind of just label each area. We'll go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay, so working through this, we'll go initial. And initial, this is at QP, our private optimal. And we'll take a look at the consumer surplus, the producer surplus, and society's surplus. And what we'll see in this, let's start off with our consumer surplus. Let's do our consumer surplus in blue. So consumer surplus is underneath our marginal benefit, underneath our demand curve, right? Underneath our maximum willingness to pay all the way to the price that I have to pay. So that is to start off, I would be getting A, B, C, D as my consumer surplus. So that was A plus B plus C plus D. Producer surplus, what was going on there? Well, same kind of idea. Let's uh, figure that guy out. We'll use red for producer surplus. We have below the price, above my minimum willingness to accept, that's my marginal private cost curve, all the way out to the quantity exchanged, and below the price. So that gives me F, G, and H. I would have all that as my producer surplus. So that was F plus G plus H. And you'd be like, okay, great. Let's just add this up here and let's work this out. But let's keep in mind that we actually have this pollution cost, right? So, hey, consumers, they got that benefit from consuming. Producers, they got that benefit from producing. But we actually want to also incorporate, let's use yellow for this, our external cost. That is the cost of producing this pulp that is not being paid for by the consumers, right? When you buy paper, that's not in the price. It's not being paid for in producers. They're not paying anybody for their right to pollute. It's just being thrown out there and every member of society has to pay a share of it. Well, what is this area? Well, okay, we can work this area out as we are producing QP. And every unit we produce up until QP has an external cost to society that is measured as this vertical distance between the two lines. So that is, if we want to think about it, all the way from zero production. If we were to go this entire area here between our two lines, between the marginal social cost and the marginal private cost, all the way out to the amount we produce, that would be in entirety our marginal, sorry, not our marginal external cost, that would be our external cost, right? That is the total external cost society faces. So what would that be? That would be G plus C plus D plus H plus E. So, okay, let's work out our social surplus now in this case here. Typically, we'd say, okay, Consumer plus producer is social. Well, okay, we have this cost going on. So to work out our surplus, we have to go consumer plus producer minus our external cost. So let's start canceling stuff off here. What, uh, what cancels each other out? G, that's there. Uh, C, that's there. D, H, and oh, I just have this extra cost that we're just facing all together of E. So that doesn't, that doesn't cancel off at all. So what am I left with for social surplus? From the consumer, I'm getting A plus B. From the producer, I'm getting F. And then I just have this leftover of minus E. 
right? I just have this negative cost that I'm incurring that is going to be canceling out some of my surplus. So we just kind of lose this extra cost as society. So in this case here, this pollution, this production of pulp is problematic, and we just face an extra cost from it. Let's, let's draw this again. We'd have our price, we'd have our quantity. Downward sloping here. This guy, this is my marginal social benefit, which is the same as my marginal private benefit. Upward sloping, this guy here, this is my marginal private cost curve, the cost of the firm itself. And we could pretend we're still talking about pulp, such that this guy here, this is my marginal external, sorry, not my marginal external, my marginal social cost, which is equal to the marginal private cost plus the marginal external cost. Keep in mind again, that was this vertical distance between the two lines, that vertical distance, that was my marginal external cost, the extra cost society bears for every extra unit produced. Okay, we want to go and take a look at all the tools we have in our toolbox and figure out how exactly we can force this market to get from the initial equilibrium, I'll call that Q0, P0, to a new equilibrium at, well, that's not P, at Q1, P1. And if we go and we take a look back through all of our price controls, so take a look at them. We had price ceilings, price floors, quotas. What else did we have? We had taxes and we had tariffs. What we should be able to see, what should kind of be popping out on us is that this diagram, if you kind of squint at it and you ignore all the labels on it, this here is kind of very similar as to our final outcome when we put in a tax, when we began to tax a good or service. That caused an augmentation of the supply curve such that the supply curve got augmented up to the left. That is, in order for us to ideally, in order for us to efficiently be able to correct for this market failure, right? And again, the reason why it's a market failure, marginal social cost does not equal marginal private cost, right? They are not equal to each other. So in order to correct for this, what we would want to do is we would want to put in a tax. And then the question comes, okay, how much do we tax? What size of tax do we put into place? And again, we want to keep in mind that, hey, when we put in a tax, we said that, okay, if this was our supply curve, we put in a tax, it augmented it upwards, such that we would have a new supply plus tax line, right? And it was just supply plus tax, marginal private cost, marginal private cost plus marginal external cost. That is in that tax case, the tax was the vertical distance between these two lines. That was my tax per unit. So as we go through this, okay, what do we want to set our tax at in order to correct for this market failure, in order to get firms to actually price properly, in order for them to bring this extra pollution cost into their production process? Well, in order for get society to realize that and to change their behavior accordingly, we want to set this tax equal to our marginal external cost. If we set this one and the same, one and equal to each other, we're gonna end up at a new quantity exchanged right there. I'll call that quantity tax. We'll end up at a new price, right? This is our consumer price, price tax. And then what's the other side of that? Well, the other side of that is that we get right there, this guy. This is our price which producers now end up receiving underneath the tax. Such that, what's that distinction there again? Well, that distinction between price consumer, price tax, and price producer, that is gonna be our tax per unit, 
Or as we've now seen, that would also be our marginal external cost, that extra cost that society is facing. And we see that now by putting it into a tax, this extra cost of society is being realized, is actually being collected, and it's being shared between the people who consume this good and the people who produce this good. And in that way there, the government can collect tax revenue. That tax revenue can then be used to building that water treatment plant. That tax revenue can be used to devote to health care, to mitigate for the extra cost for health-borne problems that we have from all these environmental damages. All of this allows government revenue to be able to correct for this market failure. In this, let's go again through a bit of a surplus analysis. Let's see who the winners are, who the losers are, following this implementation of a tax onto a good that is has this negative production externality. So let's take a look at that. And we can work this through numerically as well. So we'll work through it once, just again, geometric area, saying, hey, point A, or sorry, area A, area B, etc. And then we'll work through it once mathematically, actually calculating for everything. So well, let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at a example here. We have our market for oil. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and impose a external cost on this market. We're going to say, hey, you know what? Likely in the process of creating and producing crude oil, we're going to have this external cost that society faces, right? This is going to be in forms of pollution, in forms of uh, industrial runoff all of the kind of excess problems that are going to be associated with this production process. What we've said here is, okay, we have this marginal external cost of $12 per barrel. That's our issue. That's the extra cost per barrel that society ends up having to pay for that isn't incorporated in the current price of oil, right? And that's the problem with this external cost is that the producers aren't incorporating it in their production decision. The consumers aren't thinking about it in determining how much to buy. And so this extra $12 per barrel isn't really being felt by producers or consumers. And so instead it's being distributed across all of society. And that is the issue there. Well, what we want to do is we want to first work out what is our consumer? What is our producer? What is our social surplus altogether? at the initial private equilibrium. So again, private equilibrium, just our individual independent agents coming together, figuring out what's our market price, what's our market quantity exchanged. That is again determined where our marginal private cost equals our marginal private benefit. Problem is, when we have an external cost, when we have extra costs that are not being witnessed or not being uh, incurred by the producer or the consumer, well, this equilibrium is no longer an allocatively efficient equilibrium. The allocatively efficient equilibrium occurs where the marginal social cost equals the marginal social benefit. And let's keep in mind that our marginal social cost is equal to the marginal private cost plus the marginal external cost. So let's start off by getting an idea as to what our marginal social cost curve is. So in this case here, keep in mind, this is our marginal private. The marginal social cost is just sitting up above it because we're just adding on this marginal external cost. So marginal social cost parallel augmentation upwards would be something like this. Marginal social cost, which is equal to the marginal private cost plus that marginal external cost. Again, keep in mind that vertical distance here that vertical distance between these two lines, that is just that external cost, that is the marginal external cost, how much extra cost society faces for every extra barrel of oil sold. Okay, in this case, well, that vertical distance is all over the place, including this vertical distance right here at our intercept point, meaning, okay, if we have an external cost of $12 a barrel, well, that goes two up to 14. That would be my new intercept for my marginal social cost. So if we wanted to label this, right, what do we have going on here? This guy, that's my supply or my marginal private cost. This guy here, 62 minus 2Q, negative slope, that's my demand or my marginal private benefit. This is one and the same as my marginal social benefit. All that means for these two to be the same means that 
hey, me, if I consume this, I get all the benefit. There's no extra benefit that society gets because I consumed oil. I'm a member of society, so my benefit is society's benefit. If we wanted to get the marginal social cost, though, well, keep in mind, marginal social cost is just marginal private cost plus marginal external cost. So what's our marginal private cost? Price equals 2 plus 4Q plus my marginal external cost of 12. So, okay, work that together. Price is 14 plus 4Q. And that there is my marginal social cost. Okay, at, underneath this now we would have, okay, we have our private equilibrium, and then we would move on and we would have our ideal social equilibrium, where we would like to be, the allocatively efficient equilibrium. And in order to find that out, that would be this point here and that point there. So I'm just going to call that P social and quantity social. That would be our social equilibrium. But keep in mind, that's not where we're at right now. What we want to do initially, let's solve for our surplus. And let's just kind of do this geometrically to see what's going on. And keep in mind how we're going to correct for this market failure. And the way we're going to correct for this market failure, keep in mind, we took a look at that in the previous one. We kind of just generically said, hey, what does this remind us of? It reminds us of this kind of situation where we had a tax and we said that, hey, we could correct for this by setting a tax equal to the marginal external cost. And if we set a tax equal to the marginal external cost, what did we end up getting? Here is my original supply curve, my marginal cost, marginal private cost. If we put a tax equal to the MEC, well, my new augmented tax line, would fall right on top of that social cost line, which would mean I would have a, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna drag this down so I can write there. That would be my marginal private cost plus tax, right? And in this case here, that marginal private cost plus the tax is falling right on top of my marginal social cost line. Instead of, hey, this being the social equilibrium, well, this would now be, my tax price that consumers pay. And then, hey, because we had to pay a tax, well, what does that mean? It means consumers pay a higher price, but producers, producers, they don't get to keep that entire PT. They only get to keep our price producer, right? They only get to keep a little bit of that because they have to remit the difference. Keep in mind, vertical distance between these two lines they have to remit this difference back to the government as a tax. So that difference there, that is my tax per unit. Okay, so we have the initial setup done. Let's now go work through our surplus. And the way we're going to do that is we're just going to label the geometric areas. We're not even going to do it mathematically to start. So we're just going to go area A, B, this little guy I'm going to call C, D, Keep in mind, we want this triangle here, E, uh, what do I have, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I'll call that guy I, and J. So, okay, we have all of our geometric areas labeled. Let's go through and work out our consumer surplus before, producer surplus before, all of that, all of that jazz. So, let's go take a look. We'll go initial. And initial consumer, producer, we're then going to have our external cost. Because right in the initial situation, we're not putting a tax into place. So we have this external cost that society is facing. And then we'll have our social. Keep in mind as we go through this, consumer surplus is a benefit. Producer is a benefit. External cost is a cost. And social surplus is then, of course, the benefit. So let's go through. Let's start off with our consumer surplus. We'll do that. We'll identify it in blue. So what are we doing? At the private optimal, right? Nothing has happened. We have no intervention. The market is just at itself. We are all the way at quantity of 10 there. So, oh, that's the wrong color. 
everything below my demand curve, below my maximum willingness to pay, all the way up to the quantity exchanged of 10, above the price I do pay. So initial equilibrium of $42 per barrel, and I get my initial consumer surplus. So here we go, initial consumer surplus would be A plus B plus C plus D. Moving on, let's take a look at that producer surplus. So producer surplus is our marginal private cost, right? The marginal cost of the firm, that firm's minimum willingness to accept. And we would go above their minimum willingness to accept all the way to the quantity exchanged of 10, below the price they do accept of 42. And we would get our producer surplus then. We can shade all that guy in. And we can see that that would be FGH, F plus G, oh, don't know what happened there. F plus G plus H plus I plus J. So quite a bit of uh, area there for that, F, G, H, I, J, yep. Okay, we're not done yet. We still have this external cost to consider. So for the external cost, this is that cost that just isn't being incorporated in the price or in the production decision. No one directly is incurring this cost, and so it falls on the greater society altogether. And that's the issue. In this case here, our cost per unit is $12 per unit, right? The difference between 14 and two. And so we have the difference, the vertical distance between these two curves over the 10 units being, being consumed. So that's gonna give us something like that, something like that. And we get this whole area here as our external cost, the whole green, yellowy green kind of area there. And so what does that work out to be? That's gonna be an external cost of J plus G plus H plus C plus D plus E. All right, so quite, quite a bit covered up there. Okay, what we want to do for our social surplus then to work this guy out, it's going to be consumer plus producer minus the external cost. So what we might as well do is we might as well just start canceling off the areas that are covered up by external cost. So that would be J. Uh, what else do I have here? G, where's G? There's G. H. C. And D. E is not incorporated in there. That's just extra cost that we face that is not canceling out surplus. So just that's that's just problematic. What we're doing then is we're doing consumer surplus plus producer surplus minus external cost. So we get A plus B plus F plus I. And then we're minusing external cost, so minus E. And we get all together what society surplus is underneath this externality, underneath the fact that, hey, we have this external cost of producing oil that is not being incorporated into the pricing of oil. So what happens if we put on a tax? Well, if we put on a tax, things change a little bit. So now all of a sudden if we're out of tax, we're at this yellow line, the marginal private cost plus tax. Our market price is no longer 42 but rather consumers are gonna be playing price T, producers are gonna be receiving price producer, and we're gonna be producing at Q social. So in that case there, let's clean up this diagram. Let's go right back to the start there. We're gonna get rid of all the shading that's going on, and we'll resolve this given our tax scenario. So let's clean it up a bit. Okay, so we'll go over here, we'll go, with a tax and we'll see what happens underneath a tax scenario to our surplus and say okay are we winners are we losers what exactly is happening if we implement a tax in this scenario so okay who's our players underneath the tax we have our consumer surplus again we're gonna have our producer surplus again we're also going to have our tax revenue 
right? Keep in mind, tax revenue is actually a positive to society because this is money being collected by the government on behalf of society to then be redistributed towards social goods. So tax revenue is a positive, and then we will have our social surplus. And the reason why we don't include our external cost in this case is because if we've set, if we have set our tax equal to the marginal external cost, there is no external cost anymore. This has entirely been figured out. It's entirely been brought into the production process, into the pricing of this good. There's no longer any cost that is not incorporated in the cost of production or the cost to buy it. And that's the big thing here is to get the true cost to be recognized, not to be just throwing these costs out for society to deal with. So, okay, consumer surplus. Let's start off with that guy. To identify that, again, we'll use blue for our consumer surplus. Keep in mind, we're now at this Q social. So Q social is going to be below my willingness to pay all the way up to the quantity exchanged above the price I do pay. So price tax. So in that case there, producer surplus, we see it's quite a bit lower. It's only A. Producer surplus. Well, producer surplus, we'll do this guy here again in red. Our producer surplus is going to be above my minimum willingness to accept. So that's my private cost curve. So above my willingness to accept all the way up to the quantity exchanged below the price I receive, right? Keep in mind price producer is that price that I receive underneath the tax. So I get this red area here of I and J as my producer surplus. What do we have for the next one there? Tax revenue. Well, for tax revenue, let's use yellow for tax revenue. Tax revenue, we have our tax per unit, which is this height here. Price tax minus price producers receive. So that height over Q social units. So I get that area as my tax revenue, which works out to be B, C, F, G. B plus C plus F plus G. In this case here, D, H, and E are just not counted. We're not at that level of production, right? We're only at Q social, not at 10. So these guys here are just not being received. Altogether then, our social surplus, our social surplus is going to be A plus B plus C, no D, but hey, there is a F, G, no H, but then there is a I and J. And so if we go now and we compare our surpluses in each case, we see that, hey, social surplus altogether, significantly higher. So in this case here, by putting in a tax, by taxing this externality, we win all together as a society. Well, if that's the case, right? If we see, okay, clearly society is better off underneath the tax. Why are policies such as carbon taxes or tax on gasoline or these kind of situations that have a known external effect, why are they so unpopular? Well, the reason why they're so unpopular is because initially we never had to pay for them. They were free. We could just, hey, pollute the environment with no cost to us at all. By making us recognize the cost of pollution, by making us recognize that cost of the externality, what happens to consumers? Well, consumers used to receive A, B, C, D. They now just receive A. So consumers, they're worse off, they're sad. What about producers? They used to get F, G, H, I, J. Now producers just get I, J. So producers are worse off. So, okay, they're not very happy. We see that the consumer side, they've lost. We've seen that the producer side, they've lost. So two big players in this market, they feel like this tax has just been an attack against them. Who's really the only player in society that's kind of winning in this case? Well, government tax revenue has gone up. So from an individual viewpoint, it's like, wow, I just got hurt and the government just gets extra money. This just seems like a cash grab to me. But 
back up who's who's winning overall well overall we have society being better off right society overall is better off we're dealing with this but what's the issue with that the issue with that is well we individually don't really care about society i care about me i care about making my utility my happiness the highest that i can the producer doesn't really care about society. The producer cares about their profit. And so in both cases, the individual has been hurt. This kind of ethereal idea of greater society, the greater good has increased, sure. But you can imagine in the political realm, in the politics game of this, as people are voting and they're voting for their embetterment, well, it's pretty difficult to vote for a policy that you know is going to make you worse off, even if it makes society on whole better off. So big reason why these are so difficult politically to put into place, even though economically it's pretty clear that this is a social good. This increases social welfare, makes all of us significantly better off, believe it or not, by actually having to pay for the resources you use. And in this case here, the resource that's being used that right now we get to use for free would be the environment. That would be the cost there. Of course, we can also figure this out mathematically, right? So we've gone through it just kind of with these labeling geometric shapes. Well, let's take a look at a mathematical solution and let's solve through it that way. In order to do so again, I'm gonna clean up this diagram and we'll start right back from the start. Okay, so let's go back and let's take a look at this and let's solve this mathematically, actually get the value of the surplus before versus after. So in order to actually figure this out, what we need to do first is we need to solve for this price tax. We also need to solve for this price producer. So in order to do that, what we need to do is, of course, first solve for Q social. So let's move over to the right and let's work this guy out. And the way that we'd solve for Q social is we would set equal our marginal social benefit with our price plus tax. That is that marginal social cost line. So marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. That's my marginal private cost plus tax. That's going to be social benefit 62 minus 2Q. 62 minus 2Q equals, what do I have here? 14 plus 4Q. Okay, working through, I'm going to move that 2 to the other side. So I'll have 62 equals 14 plus 6Q. Then I'm going to subtract 14 from both sides. So 62 minus 14 will yield 48 equals 6Q. Divide both sides by 6 to get that Q alone. And I have 8 equals my new quantity social. So let's update that quantity social, that guy there, that's the value of eight. Now what I wanna figure out is what is my price underneath the tax or alternatively, what is the price that producers pay, receive rather, price producers receive. Going through that, I'm gonna to go to the price tax. To get the price tax, let's keep in mind how we're gonna do that. We're gonna take this eight up to my demand curve and then from my demand curve across to get the price. So, okay, calling in the demand or that marginal social benefit, that is price equals 62 minus two Q. My Q is eight in this case. So two times eight is 16. So 62 minus 16 is a price of 46. So let's update that price tax. And that guy there is now 46. To get the price producers receive, two ways I could do this. I could take this eight up to my supply line. Well, that line jumped a little bit. I could take this eight up to my supply line and then from there go across to the price producers receive. What I could also do though is just witness, hey, okay, consumers are paying $46 a barrel. My tax per unit was $12 per barrel. So 46 minus 12, vertical distance. Vertical distance is just the size of my tax. So 46 minus 12 would yield a 
34. Let's just erase that and update the number. 34 for the price which producers are receiving. Keeping in mind that distance there between the two, that distance is my $12 per unit, my tax. Now let's use that the right color. $12 per unit tax. Okay, from here we can begin to solve for what our, what our areas are. And in order to do that, let's start off by figuring out our consumer surplus. So we can just go back. We don't need to go through and re-identify it all. We can just go and kind of look at it and say, okay, what did I have? I had a consumer surplus of A, B, C, D. So A, B, C, D, that is going to be a triangle essentially, right? That's this triangle here, A, B, C, D. So that guy, oh, let's keep our kind of color coordinated. Blue, initially A, B, C, D, that's just a triangle. So that's one half base. Well, A, B, C, D, all the way from zero to 10. So I have a base of 10 and I have a height of, well, 42 to 62. So 62 minus 42 is 20. Altogether, I had a consumer surplus of 100. So A, B, C, D, that was equal to 100. Very similarly, we could go work out our producer surplus, F, G, H, I, J. So okay, in that case there, F, G, H, I, J. Again, just another triangle. So that guy's gonna be one half base. Again, base is between zero and 10. And in this case here, my height is going from two up to 42. So 10 to 40, and that will give me a producer surplus of 200. Okay, what do I have for my external cost? Well, my external cost is J, G, H, C, D, E. So that is gonna be essentially, this is just a rectangle that's tilted a little bit. So that's just gonna be base times height. That is, I'm selling 10 units at an external cost per unit of 12, right? My height here, that is 14 minus two, that's 12 over all together 10. So that is 120 as my, mar as my total external cost, right? Marginal external cost was 12, total external cost is 120. So then to work out my social surplus, what am I doing? I'm doing 100 plus 200 is 300. 300 minus my external cost is 120, giving me 180 as my social surplus. So in this market here, by buying and selling oil, we have a social surplus of $180 because of this. Great, that's our initial scenario. Let's move forward to our tax scenario. And let's resolve this. So initially with the tax, consumer surplus is A. So okay, A in this case here, let's, uh, let's kind of just erase some of these extra bits that I put in. So A, this is again just a triangle. So if we wanted to work that out, we would have one half. Our base in this case is all the way from zero to our coin exchange of eight. So one half eight times the height of 62 minus 46, that's height of 16 here. So eight times 16, and that gives us one half base times height, an area of 64. Producers, similarly, they're now just getting I and J. So again, just a triangle. One half, what's our base in this case? Zero to quantity exchanged is eight. And now we have a height of price we receive of 34 all the way down to two. So that's a height of 32. We have one half base times height yielding 128. So quite clearly we see consumers lost, producers lost, Tax revenue, what are we getting in tax revenue? 
we're getting $12 per unit, all over eight units being produced and thus taxed. So base, base times height, that's just going to be, let's just carry tax revenue out like this. Now this is going to be base of eight times a height of 12. Eight times 12 yields us 96. Thus, altogether, our social surplus, consumer, producer, tax revenue. So we get 64 plus 128 plus 96 gives us altogether a social surplus of 288. And in this way here, we see quite clearly that society wins because of this tax being put into place by us being able to control this externality, bring it down under control. But because of this, consumers lose, producers lose. The only real winner is government and their tax revenue, which is then going back to benefit society on whole. So that's the idea of a negative production externality and how it ends up impacting and being worked through in this scenario here. If you have any questions about that, right, a lot going on, feel free to reach out to me, email D2L. What I want to take a look at next is just very briefly the idea of a positive externality, right? And that's just to show you that this does go both ways. Um, we're not going to spend much time going through this. We're probably not even going to look at any questions really getting at this. It's just to show you that there is also these positive externalities. So in the case of a positive externality, let's just take a look at a fictional market here. We would have price, we would have quantity, and of course we would have downward sloping here. Our marginal social benefit, and that's the marginal private benefit. So again, from the consumption side, these are one and the same. I'm looking at production externalities, that is the costs of production are different, based off of whether it's a social cost or a private cost. So here I would have my marginal private cost of production yielding my initial equilibrium. So there's my initial price and my initial quantity underneath that private optimal. And I'll just go P naught for initial price. In this scenario, great. We have our cost of production, but every time that we produce something, we actually lower the cost for all of society. And it's like, what? How does that even happen? How can you produce something and then lower other people's costs? Well, a great example of this is actually uh, beekeepers. All right, in this case here, if we were looking at, okay, I want to have a bunch of beekeepers on, or sorry, not a bunch of beekeepers, but a bunch of beehives on my orchard in order to go about and pollinate all of my trees, get my apples to grow better, get more of a better crop out of it. Well, okay, as I determine how many beehives to put on, right, you can lease these and put them on your orchard. I would say, okay, here's my price of it. That's going to be the quantity as to how much I'm going to get. Marginal private cost equals marginal private benefit because I'm getting all the benefit of this. However, by me going and putting a bunch of beehives on my orchard, all of my neighbors, right? Keep in mind, bees don't know property lines. You can't put up like these fences to keep the bees only on your orchard. Bees don't know property lines. They're going to be flying around everywhere, including all of the neighbor's orchards. So as they fly around to all the neighbor's orchards, you incurred the cost of the beehives, but your neighbors are also getting the benefit of these beehives. A result of this is it's lowering their costs of production for every quantity being produced, right? Sorry, for every price there, they're getting more quantity being supplied. That is, their marginal social cost has fallen. Altogether, the marginal social cost is lower than the marginal private cost because you have lowered everybody else's cost of production by incurring the cost of beehives yourself. Here's the interesting bit though. By going through this, we would want a socially optimal number of beehives all the way out here, right? We would want to have more beehives being leased. As you had more beehives being leased, well, yes, the price of beehives should fall, but 
despite this, we won't end up there, right? We won't end up there on our own because the market individuals rationalizing their own benefits, their own costs, these rational individuals would stop at private benefit equals private cost. So we wouldn't be producing enough beehives. You wouldn't be having enough beehives on orchards to get our socially optimal level. How do we solve this? Well, okay, in the last case with a negative externality, we solved it with a tax. In this scenario with a positive production externality, we would want to solve this. Keep in mind, here, vertical distance between these two. That vertical distance, this is still my marginal external cost. In this case, it's just a negative cost. Negative cost is a benefit. What I would want to do in order to get that to my private cost to overlay my social cost is I would want to put in a subsidy. I would want to subsidize the use of leasing beehives. And in this case here, this would be my subsidy per unit. And by putting in a subsidy per unit, I align that private cost with that social cost, right? Keep in mind what that does is I would then have marginal private cost plus my subsidy, augmenting my supply curve downwards and yielding a new, just like that, my new equilibrium, such that now if we had the subsidy in place, P1, this would be the price underneath the subsidy, this would be the price that I pay for a beehive, right, to lease it. Government subsidizes the vertical distance between the two lines, so okay, I'm paying price S, price subsidy, but the beekeepers, they get right back up on their private cost line, they get to receive that one there. So in this case here, that would be my price producers, the price which the producers receive for it. So I get subsidized, I get to pay less for my beehives, but the beekeepers themselves, they still receive actually a higher price, thus willing to produce and offer more beehives for sale. So an example of a positive externality, like I said, our focus, because we're going to move on into taking a look at environmental economics, our focus really is going to be on the negative externality, but just to make you aware that that is there. If you really wanted to dig deep into it as well, what we've taken a look at, we've just generically called these positive negative externalities. These, this guy, and this guy have actually both been examples of positive and negative production externalities. We could also have positive and negative externalities of consumption. And in that case there, we would have a differentiation between social benefit and private benefit. Again, yes, it's of interest to us. Yes, it's a big field of take courses entirely on this. Our focus going forward is strictly going to be on that negative production externality. So if you're interested in it, feel free to take a look at it. Right. In reality, as you move forward in microeconomics, externalities, the study, the correction, fixing market failures really is the move forward. Right. This whole idea of, hey, everything is efficient. Everything is at the market equilibrium. That gets pretty boring. It's just, OK, yay, the market worked. What do we get to do? Correcting market failures is the interesting part of micro. That's where the field moves forward as you take more and more courses in it. But intro negative production externality, that will be our focus going forward. So stepping on, we'll be taking a look at how this model carries forward with us and taking a look at environmental economics. That does us for this video though. If you have any questions on working through any of these externalities, feel free to reach out to me. Big thing, right, is that these externalities cause market failures. If we did not correct them with a tax, we would not be allocatively efficient. We would either be producing too much or too little of the good relative to the social optimal, and thus we need government intervention. We need that government tax to be put into place in order to correct this. That is the big takeaway here. Any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks.